Well, hi, folks keep asking me, this Russia-Ukraine war, is this a sign that Jesus is about to come? They say, you know, Duncan, what, what do you think? Does it fulfill Bible prophecy? And people have got all sorts of theories. Well, before I answer that, I'll tell you that I'm 55 years old, and I've been a believer since I was baptized at the age of 16. And at different times in those years, I've been very enthusiastic that, hey, this world situation fulfills Bible prophecy and Jesus is about to come. And well, I was sort of wrong because he didn't come. Why did I make those mistakes? Well, I have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. I want to see him. I am very enthusiastic to see him. And that, that of course, tilts a bit how I look at the Bible and world events. Oh, let's hope this is it. Let's hope that is it. And uh, I wouldn't say in my defense, but uh, it, I think it is also true, though, that there is a teaching in the New Testament that the believer is to live as if their Lord is about to come. That is how we should live. Whether or not he comes in our lifetime in the bigger picture doesn't matter because death is as a sleep. And to be absent from the body in that sense is to be present with the Lord because the next waking moment the Lord has come in the resurrection. But... I want to answer the questions about, do you think this Russia-Ukraine business is fulfilling Bible prophecy? And yeah, there is a picture presented in the Bible of the situation that there will be in the last days. And it is very tempting to look at the current world situation to say, that does not look like this could be it. And that's the spirit in which I give my answers. What I want to do is to first of all give you what I see as a biblical picture of the last days. And then we'll look in more detail at the general world situation at this point and the particulars of the Russia-Ukraine situation and how that does possibly fit in with the biblical picture of the last days. Well, the Bible is a Jewish book, and it is based on the land that was promised to Abraham, which is not simply the territory now possessed by the state of Israel, but the land promised to Abraham, from roughly the Euphrates River to the Mediterranean, and down south a bit to the Egyptian border. Well, that's the focus of the Bible, and of Bible prophecy, and I don't think that Russia, Ukraine, Britain, America, Australia, Wherever, I don't think that they particularly specifically feature in the biblical narrative. What we do have is a picture in the book of Daniel and other parts of the Old Testament of how that land promised to Abraham is going to be dominated by a series of powers and then the Lord Jesus shall return at a time when those powers are dominating the land of Israel. Well, at the moment, there is the state of Israel that formed in 1948. And we have prophecies like Zechariah 14 that says just before the Lord Jesus comes, Jerusalem will fall to her enemies. The nations around her will attack her. Women raped in the streets, people dragged off into captivity, many people killed. And then the Lord Jesus appears on the Mount of Olives from where he ascended to heaven. He will so come, the angel said, in like manner as he was seen to ascend into heaven. And that picture continues as a golden thread all through the Bible, culminating, of course, in the book of Revelation, where again you have the earth or the land, I would say the land promised to Abraham, being dominated by a ten-horned beast, and you have this number of 10 very often in the Old Testament. Psalm 83 describes a situation where 10 nations that surround Israel will attack her like a beast. Ezekiel 38, you have 10 nations that are going to form a confederacy and attack her. And according to a number of those prophecies, the people of Israel and the land of Israel are going to suffer. So I obviously don't buy the sort of Christian Zionist idea that every bullet fired by an IDF soldier always goes to its mark. 
You see, the whole reason why this thing is structured in the way it is, is to lead Israel to Jesus Christ, is to lead them to repentance and to re-entering the covenant with God. And unfortunately, that is going to require this invasion that the Bible from the Old Testament right through to the New Testament keeps on predicting. The Lord Jesus in the Olivet Prophecy spoke about this when he said that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled and game's over for this world and he comes back. To Thessalonians 2, there will appear a man of sin in the Jerusalem temple in that area who will be destroyed by the brightness of the Lord's return. So, putting it all together, yep, there is going to be a sort of Assyria or Babylon reformed, a redivivus, as it were, of the old Assyrian Empire that dominated Judah and captured, uh, and took away God's people into captivity and, and the Babylonians who came and desecrated the temple and so on. This is going to be repeated, okay? And I suppose it couldn't really have had much of a chance of being fulfilled before 1948. There was no state of Israel. There were not large numbers of Jews living in the land. But now, since 1948, which is already, you know, good over 70 years ago, there has been a state of Israel. There are Jewish people living in the land of Israel, and they are surrounded by Islamic folks who want to destroy them. And the question is, well, why didn't why they get on and do it? You know, Israel is outnumbered by her enemies hugely. Why don't they get on and do it? You know, they all declare their implacable hatred of Israel and their disagreement with the Jewish state and, and so on. There's something that stops them. In 2 Thessalonians 2, talking about how this man of sin will be revealed in the Jerusalem temple and will be destroyed by the brightness of the return of Jesus, it says that there's something that withholds that from happening that has to be taken out of the way. We look at the current world situation and you think, well, why does Israel have this apparently charmed life? Why are they there where they are? Uh, and why don't their enemies just scribble them and, and just overrun them by sheer force of numbers? Well, it's something called the West, that the West is the foil that holds that back. Those nations know you, you go for Israel, America particularly is going to be there and it's going to, no, it's not going to happen. Huge amount of aid is poured into Israel from America. And that's what's holding it back. You see the Russia-Ukraine war and you think, what, what is that? How does that? figure in all this? Well, I think this is how it figures. I think that what you're seeing now, whichever way the war goes, you're seeing another alignment of nations lining up, as it were, as a foil to the West. And you can see this with what is going on economically. The West have tried to cut off Russia economically, so of course, what are they driven to do, to make treaties with the likes of China, etc. And there's a lot of significant nations who have been kicked out of the sort of the world family, if you like, by the West in recent years. They've been turned into pariah states. Syria, Iran, North Korea, Afghanistan. Now, they are all characterized by a very strong hatred of Israel and a desire to destroy Israel. Then you've got China, and you think, well, I don't think China would particularly uh, side with uh, that bunch. Yeah, China wants money. That's all they're about. But they also have a pride thing. Very, very upset over Taiwan that they consider is theirs. And America has said, if you go into Taiwan, we will start a war with you, China. Uh, well, that suddenly puts China in a different position. So you have this range of nations who have been made pariahs one way or another or fallen out with the West, 
who have been driven by the situation with Russia and the sanctions against Russia, they've been driven to come together. And there's other nations here and there around the world who are not opposed to getting involved with the alternative to the West, for whatever reason, Venezuela, all sorts of places. Now, when I was a kid growing up, it was the Cold War, and the West had its foil. It was called the Soviet Union. And there was this sort of balance of power between the two. The Soviet Union broke up about 30 years ago, and a number of the republics, as it were, joined the West. Our beloved Latvia, Lithuania, and, and so forth, joined up effectively with the West. And so for the last 30 years, the West has been without a foil. And what happens when empires have no foil to them? What happened when Alexander the Great of Greece cried that there was no, nowhere else to conquer? Well, he died and his four generals took over and the whole thing split up. What happened with Rome? They dominated everything and then they turned in on themselves. This is what happens. And of course, nobody learns from history, but... <laughs> That is, that is the pattern. We, because we're living through it, we don't see it. That's what's happening. The West is turning in on itself. It's had no foil to it. And it's time and tide, I'm afraid, the, the tide of human history is simply turning against the West, but they don't see it. So I'm suggesting that the West is what is stopping it, that group of nations around Israel attacking her and bringing about the biblical situation for the last days. Now, the West could be taken down in a number of ways. Somebody can press the button on nuclear weapons and do a lot of damage. There can be total financial crisis. West is hopelessly in debt. There can be a really serious virus breakout, far, far worse than COVID-19 be all sorts of things that happen. And the West, in any case, as I say, is, is divided against itself. And what we've seen in the last 10 years throughout the West, particularly Western Europe, is the rise of the right wing. You have nations like Sweden, Italy, who have got people in power who earlier would have been seen as right wing extremists. You have people running the UK the last while, who are definitely far to the right of centre compared to historically how leaders were. You have, at least in all these countries, you have a more significant right wing than there ever was. And what the right wing typically stand for is nationalism. And they are all against foreign wars. Why should our people, the argument goes, be poor, unemployed, uh, social benefits being cut, whilst we're pouring billions into whatever foreign war. Why should our boys go out there and die in some foreign land? We just sort ourselves out. And that has a lot of currency with a lot of folks. You have the problem of democracy, <clears throat> that the idea is that you have multi parties, and the theory is that the majority choose their leader. Well, it's a nice idea, but that isn't how it quite goes, because if you have multi-parties, you can have a position quite easily, where out of 100% of people in a country, only 25% actually voted for the guy who's in power. It depends how you run the electoral college, it depends on how many parties you've got competing, things like that. And as Winston Churchill quipped the Biggest argument against democracy is a five minute chat with the average voter. In other words, the people are woefully misinformed. They watch something on YouTube and consider themselves a world expert and they vote accordingly. Um, <clears throat> so that means that the people who are in power are in fact people who are trying to bring together very disparate coalitions. And so you have arising a, a weakness of leadership and that's another thing that I certainly see in the Western world, a very low quality of leadership. There is not, uh, there are not strong leaders any longer. There's huge division. You take America, 
America, from what I see, has never been more divided. It, it is just impossible to talk about politics because you're either on one side or the other or this side or whatever. Society is dividing. The West is turning in on itself. And as I say, look at the time and tide of human empires. You get to the top and then you, you go down because you turn on yourself. Now, whether that is so or not, or whether you particularly have one particular view on this point or that point, I, I think that is how it is. People are deeply divided. Issues such as LGBTQ+, etc., divide uh, very strongly and understandably. You know, one group sees it this way, another group is seeing it that way. And, and it, Western society is divided more than it ever was. It really was. And the old school issues and leaders that kept the story together, like the Queen of England, whatever you think of her, but she did keep folks together, they're gone now. So you have a divided West that is imploding on itself, that is hopelessly in debt. And you have a rising, for the first time in 30 years, a foil to the West. And you have a rising a spirit of nationalism, or at least the nationalistic argument, has got to be taken into account by the politicians who are trying to bring together all these different interest groups and parties in their various coalitions. And Rushing out to the Middle East and getting involved in a war out there? No. Especially for Jewish people? There is a rising element of Islam in, in the Western world, and it's in politics, etc. Very unlikely, I would say, that they're going to rush in there and, uh, and support Israel. So... <laughs> What does this mean, getting back to Russia and Ukraine? What's the outcome of Russia and Ukraine is that an alternative has been forged to the West. And that alternative includes nations that have got nuclear weapons. North Korea, Iran, for sure, Russia. And they're quite happy, it seems, to consider using them. They are not simply holding them as a deterrent against the West. They are showing themselves happy to proactively use those weapons. And if you want to have a fight with the West, well, you don't go and invade the UK or invade the United States. You pick on someone who is their, their poster boy or their little person whom they're supporting, and you go and go into them. And Israel would just be a great opportunity to do that. But the will to fight foreign wars is going to go down. That is already what folks are saying in the West about supporting Ukraine. Why should we support Ukraine? Why should we pour all this money in? For what end? Very nebulous ends. Nebulous in the eyes of average folks who can only see what's in front of their two eyes, what's going on in their life, their standard of living, the standard of living of the guys they live with, work with, their families, etc. Why should billions be poured in out there? That's the argument. And in the end, that argument, especially in an economy that's been weakened by COVID, that's been weakened by endless borrowing, etc. This argument, whether, as I say, right or wrong, whether you agree with it or not agree with it, that, in the end, sways politicians because you've got to get votes. That's your job as a politician to get votes. That's, that's what your job is as a politician, in the end. That is democracy for you. You've got to get votes. So you've got to be the people's man or woman. You, you have to be. So that's my view of the significance of the Russia-Ukraine war. I do think it's significant because, as I say, that along with... The background issues, bankruptcy, the legacy of COVID expenditure and so forth, have left the West in a position where after that war in Ukraine is finished to some degree, there's going to be a lot of thought that says never again, at least not quickly, especially, I think, for the United States. They historically, First World War, Second World War, were always leery about 
wars in Europe, and for good, good reason, really. And when it comes to what for them, I suppose, does not have a lot of strategic value, and that's Israel, why? Why do it? What with, you know, Muslim voices within your own party or your own nation saying no, 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 uh, etc. No. So back to the Bible, 2 Thessalonians 2, that which is stopping it, which is hindering, is going to be taken out of the way. And I do think that the issues related to the Russia-Ukraine conflict are actually for real. In leading to that situation where that foil is taken away and the nations surrounding Israel who are repeatedly predicted in the Bible as going in there and overrunning her uh, and taking over and taking Jerusalem, that's what they will do. They also have their reasons to do that. Economic difficulties, the need for foreign policy success, all this kind of stuff, finding a common chord amongst them all that can unite them about the only thing that will unite them is a hatred of the, the Jewish state as, as they see it. Yeah. So do I think the Lord is about to return? Look, I hope he returns as I'm speaking. And if you love the Lord Jesus, you want to see his return. And you are confident in his grace. If you've been baptized into the Lord, you are confident in his grace. You can be confident in his grace. You can be confident of salvation. So you want to see him. This is the cry of all the faithful right through the Bible. Lord, how long? How long, O oh Lord? Yeah, because we want to see him. Now, if you haven't been baptized into the Lord Jesus, you send me a message. Honestly, I would crawl on my hands and knees from one side of Europe to the other if I had to, to help someone get baptized. Just get baptized into the Lord Jesus. Be secure in him. Be secure in him. And have that certain hope of God's kingdom in front of you. And then, like me, you can eagerly look for signs of his coming. And life, death itself, the outcome of, of this world's politics. Then you see all that in a totally, radically different perspective. But, what I'm saying is, as a matter of interest... I do think that the situation that is developing as a result of the Russia-Ukraine war is part of a wider situation that is going to enable the biblical picture of events in the last days, of the world situation in the last days around Israel. It's enabling that to come true. Thank you. Well, this is the uh, wall. This is the wall that uh, divides the West Bank from uh, Israel proper, as it were. I was driving down the Highway 6 here. So don't tell me that Israel is now dwelling without bars and gates. Look at that barbed wire. Uh, Israel is dwelling with bars and gates, so the Ezekiel 38 invasion is not going to be happening uh, just at this moment, that's for sure.